This is lesson 2.5, and today we're going to be talking about energy levels. Our goal is to learn how light helps us understand the atom and to understand what energy levels are. So let's start off with the question, how can you make light? Now, we remember that light is just a form of energy and that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but can only be converted from one form to another. So when you make light, you need to get it from some other form of energy. You can't just create it out of nothing. Now, the first way that you can make light is known as incandescence. Incandescence sounds like incandescent light bulbs, if you've ever heard incandescent light bulbs, and that's because incandescent light bulbs work by incandescence. Now, what is incandescence? Incandescence is the conversion of heat into electromagnetic radiation, and a few examples of incandescence would be these right here, right? The sun is very hot, and so it creates a lot of light. Fire, for example, creates light through incandescence. And even this, this is kind of a pure example of incandescence, where if you heat up a piece of metal, it will glow, and it glows because it's hot. It's just the conversion of heat into light. Now, in addition to incandescence, you also have luminescence. And luminescence is sort of a catch-all term. So it is the emission of light by a substance not resulting from heat. So where does it get its energy? There are various different types of luminescence. For example, it can get it from electricity. It can get the energy from chemical reactions. And if it comes from chemical reactions, that's known as chemiluminescence. And so that's going to be found in things like glow sticks. And if it's in an animal, it would be called bioluminescence. There are a few different animals that can actually produce light through chemical reactions inside them. And that's called bioluminescence. And if the energy is coming from other types of electromagnetic radiation, that's called fluorescence or phosphorescence. So there's a lot of different things that fall under the category of luminescence. And today we're going to focus on electricity. Okay, and how can we take electricity and convert that to light? Well, one way is just through LEDs, light emitting diodes. But another way is through neon lights. Now, a neon light is what? It's basically some kind of tube that's filled with neon or some other gas at a low pressure. So low pressure by low pressure, I mean it has a small amount of the gas in there and several thousand volts. You need a very high voltage. Several thousand volts of electricity is applied to the tube. The gas inside will produce light. Now, hopefully you guys have all seen neon lights, neon gas tubes, things like this sign here, but slowly, slowly they're becoming less and less used because LEDs are more and more versatile. Now, the color of a neon light depends on the gas that's inside of it. You might think they're all filled with neon, but that's not right. Neon lights are named after that neon red. So when neon is in the tube, it's going to produce a very bright red color. That's neon. But if you fill it with a different gas, such as argon, it's going to make a purple light. If it's mercury, it's going to make a bright blue light. Or if it's hydrogen, it's going to be pink. And so all different gases produce different colors when they're put in the tube. Now, what is actually causing the different colors? Think about it. Where are these different colors coming from? Yeah, they're coming from the different gases, but why would a different gas produce different colors? So this question puzzles scientists for a while, and scientists did what scientists do. They tried to analyze it as much as possible. So they decided to look through a prism. And what do you think they saw? They saw, when they looked through a prism, lines of light. So if you look through a prism or a diffraction grating, you'll find lines of light. And those lines are different colors of light. Now, these aren't perfect pictures. So you have the whole spectrum in the background just to give you a reference of where the different colors show up. But for example, hydrogen has these different lines. It's got a red line and a teal line, a purple line, and another purple line down here. And helium has also a red line, a yellow line, and all these fine different lines through here. You've got also a green line here, some blue lines, purple lines, all that kind of stuff. Mercury's got tons of lines in it, okay? So this didn't really answer it. This actually made it a little bit more complex. Now, not only where are the colors coming from, but why are there lines of colors rather than just kind of a, a spectrum of colors? What is causing the lines? Now, it turns out that it actually took a mathematician to answer this. And back 
in 1885, Johann Balmer, who was not a scientist but a mathematician, discovered a mathematical pattern to these lines. So he specifically looked at the hydrogen lines because they were the simplest. There wasn't so many lines in the hydrogen spectrum. And he solved for that mathematical pattern and got this equation right here. So that's really interesting. Not only are there different colors, and not only are there different lines of colors, but those lines of colors fit a mathematical pattern. All right, well, what's causing this mathematical pattern? And it turns out that the answer is that atoms have different energy levels. Electrons in an atom have to be in one of those energy levels. So how are the lines of light being produced? When electrons in an atom absorb energy, they're excited. And that means that they go to a higher energy level. It takes energy to make them go up to a higher energy level. But the electrons don't stay there. They don't like to be in the higher energy levels. So they're eventually going to come back down. When they come back down, the electrons relax. That means the electrons go down to a lower energy level. And when that happens, light is given off. And the light that is given off corresponds to the energy that is lost in the process of the electron going down in energy level. It's very, very important. The energy of the photon that is given off is exactly the same as the energy that is lost by the electron as it goes down in energy level. So when we look at these lines of light, what we're looking at is the difference in energy of the energy levels in the atom. We were literally looking at the electron going up and down these energy levels and producing very specific lines of light and very specific energies being gained or lost in the process. So a nice way to picture this is through this diagram right here. So we have in this picture four different energy levels. Now atoms actually have many, many more energy levels than that. But we have pictured a simplified version. So four different energy levels. And each of these four different energy levels represents an energy that an electron in an atom is allowed to have. So when an electron goes from energy level two down to energy level one, it's losing energy. And the energy that it is lost is lost in the form of a photon. And so if the energy difference between these two different energy levels is small, the photon that it gives off has a low amount of energy. For example, in this case, it has red light. So red light is, in terms of visible light, on the low energy side, so a lower frequency, lower energy type of light. Now, if you go, for example, from energy level three down to energy level one, you're going to lose a larger amount of energy. The energy loss is entirely converted into light. And exactly one photon is given off in this transition, and that photon is going to be higher in energy than if it went from energy level two to energy level one. Going from energy level three to energy level one is a higher amount of energy lost, and so the photon has higher energy, and we would expect that to be the case. And that's exactly what we see here, because green light is higher energy, higher frequency light than red light. And we see exactly the same thing going on when an electron is in energy level four and it drops down to energy level one, we would expect even more energy to be lost and converted into light. And that's exactly what we see here. We see blue light being given off, which is even higher in energy than green and higher frequency than green. So why are there energy levels in atoms? What's causing those energy levels to even be there in the first place? It seems kind of strange that the electron would have to have a certain specific energy when it's in an atom. So what's causing this? It turns out that we can gain some insight by remembering that light is a particle that moves as a wave. Remember, there was that whole debate, is light a particle, is light a wave? Well, it's actually both. Now, it's going to get even weirder than that. It turns out that everything, everything behaves as a wave. And we don't really notice it, right? So I don't notice that I behave as a wave. And the reason for that is the more massive something is, the less noticeable its wave-like properties. So what about really, really light particles? Well, what's the lightest particle that we've talked about the whole year? That is the electron. Electrons in atoms behave as waves, and their wave-like properties are super noticeable because they're so so light. Their mass is so, so small. Now, yeah, other particles like protons and neutrons also behave as waves, but the electron's wave-like properties are even more noticeable because they're even lighter. 
So electrons and atoms behave as waves, but what does that even mean? Well, it means that if an electron behaves as a wave, it must make a standing wave in an atom. It can't just leave the atom and go back and forth. No, it has to make a standing wave in the atom. It has to be with the atom and make a wave. And so that's known as a standing wave. And I've got a few different simple standing waves. Now, this is not what the standing waves are going to look like in the atom. We're going to talk about that specifically next unit. But here are some examples of standing waves, right? And so a standing wave is a wave that repeats this pattern and stays in one specific place without the actual particles moving to some other region in space. And so here we see if we have, let's say, a slinky or a string or a rope or something, you can have a variety of different standing waves that are produced. And notice that the frequency of all four of these is different. The lowest frequency one, of course, is this one over here. It's fairly slow. It's oscillating fairly slowly. The highest frequency one is this one over here. And notice the higher the frequency, the more of these wave humps that we see in here. This, of course, being a half a wave. This is one full wave. This is going to be one and a half. And this is two full waves. So as you increase the frequency, you're able to increase more and more waves that are actually produced here, and the energy is going to increase with the frequency as well. Now, very importantly, what if we had some sort of in-between frequency? For example, what if you produced a frequency that was in between the frequency of this and the frequency of this? Would you make some kind of in-between wavelength? No. In fact, in that case, you wouldn't be able to produce a standing wave. To produce a standing wave, you have to have a very specific amount of energy and a very specific frequency. So this frequency creates this wave, this frequency creates this wave, and anything in between will not produce a standing wave. And exactly the same is true for an electron. If the electron has an in-between frequency, it won't produce a standing wave, and so it won't be allowed to stay like that in the atom. It can only have certain allowed frequencies. So, the energy of an electron in an atom is quantized. This means that an electron in an atom is only allowed to have certain energies. It can't have any kind of in-between energy. The reason for that is the electron has to have a standing wave in the atom. And this is shown through this diagram right up here, all right? Now, of course, this is a simplified version of what's going on in the atom. Don't actually think that this is what an atom really looks like. We'll get more into that next unit. So this is just a diagram to show you guys kind of what's going on, all right? And so a lower energy standing wave that an electron can produce in an atom is shown here. That's going to produce a lower energy level. And as you increase that frequency of the electron, you'll have another possible standing wave and another possible standing wave. And each of those possible standing waves are energy levels. They're possible energies of the electron. Notice that you cannot possibly have a standing wave in between here you have one wave, here you have one and a half waves. You can't possibly have a standing wave in between there, which means that the electron cannot possibly have any energy in between these two different energy levels. So each of these represents allowed energies of an electron in an atom. One way to visualize quantization is steps. Quantization is a lot like steps. On a step, you can only be at a certain allowed height, right? You can't be at an in-between height because you must be on a step. And so when you're on the step, you're at that specific height. And one height corresponds to a certain amount of gravitational potential energy. So when you have steps in everyday life, you can only have a certain amount of gravitational potential energy at any one of these given heights that you have here. But if you're on a ramp, you can have any sort of in-between amount of potential energy or in-between amount of height. So the electron in an atom is a lot like steps. It has to have a very specific amount of potential energy. It won't be able to stay in between any of the steps. It must be on one of the steps. We can take this analogy one step further and say that electrons are a lot like bowling balls in a stepped hill. This is an analogy that I like you guys to wrap your brains around because it's going to help you really understand how these energy levels work. 
So there are several different ways that this analogy is going to correspond to what's actually going on with electrons in an atom. And the first way is this, that energy is quantized, right? So you can only have certain allowed energies. You can only have certain allowed positions for these bowling balls. It must be on one of the steps. Secondly, electrons want to always go down in energy level. They want to go as low as possible that they can. They want to get to the lowest possible energy level where they'll fit. And when an electron goes down in energy level, it's going to give off energy. So if a bowling ball goes down a step, will you notice it? Yes, it's going to make a lot of sound, right? And so electrons are similar in that when they go down in energy level, they're going to give off that energy in the form of light. Also, energy levels have a limited amount of space. For most atoms, you can't take all of the electrons and fit them all onto one single energy level, right? So each energy level has a certain amount of electrons that it will hold. Last of all, you can cause an electron to go up in energy level if you add energy. And you can add energy in the form of electricity, in the form of heat, and a lot of other ways. Same thing for bowling balls. We can get them to go up to a higher step, but in order to do that, you're going to have to give them energy. You're going to have to pick them up and move them higher. So electrons are a lot like these bowling balls on a stepped hill. And I'd like you to remember these four things about that. So let's go on and go back to this diagram that I showed you guys before, and let's talk about it because it's so important. Right here at the top, if you have an electron at the top energy level, and the electron comes down in energy level, all the way down to the lowest possible energy level, it's going to give off light, and the light that it gives off is going to correspond to the energy lost by the electron in that process. In the same way, you can also cause electrons to go up in energy level. So electrons can also go up in energy level by absorbing energy. One way they can absorb energy is by absorbing light energy. And so an electron can go from energy level one up to energy level two if it absorbs a photon corresponding to the energy difference of those energy levels. It can go up from energy level one all the way up to energy level four if it absorbs a photon that corresponds to this energy that it needs to go up that high. Last of all, let's go back to the hydrogen spectrum. We remember that hydrogen has a fairly simple spectrum with a red line, a teal line, and a couple different purple lines. It's so simple that a mathematician was able to find a mathematical pattern for the energy of each of those lines, which is fairly interesting that we can now take that simple equation for the energy of those lines and determine what exactly are hydrogen's energy levels. And the equation is this. So the energy of all of the different energy levels in hydrogen are as follows. So this is the energy. This is some constant right here. And the energy is in joules. And N stands for the energy level number. So it's simply an amount of energy divided by N squared, where N is the energy level number. N equals 1 is the lowest energy level. And N equals 2 is the next. N equals 3 is the next. N equals 4 is the next, et cetera, et cetera. And so there are a bunch of different energy levels in hydrogen that all follow this equation right here. All right. Stay curious. See you guys. Have a great rest of your day.